You must be wondering what I'm doing. Well, I'm playing a recorder. A very small recorder, in matter of fact. But this is a lesson about the waves that are generated inside this recorder. And in essence, we're looking at standing waves within open and closed pipes. But specifically today, I'm gonna to be talking about closed pipes and how they generate standing waves and how you can determine the velocity of a wave using a simple device like this. So stay tuned. So what I have here is a very simple setup that allows us to set up some standing waves within my pipe here. And I have a PVC pipe that is hollow, like so. But you will note that as I put it into the water, the water level sits along the pipe. And so what we actually are generating is a closed pipe. It's open one end and closed at the other. Now I'm going to fire a sound down the tube and we're going to listen to what happens. So in this case, I'm choosing a tone app and I've got a 600 hertz sound coming out. Nice and loud, right? Nice and loud again. So what's going on? Well, stay tuned, I'm gonna explain it to you. And then afterwards, I'm going to repeat this and I'm going to show you how we can measure the velocity of sound using this setup. So before we look at the example of my pipes within the water, let's have a look at a very simplistic diagram of a pipe and why we create a standing wave within the pipe. Now, I'm going to create a sound at one opening and a sound is going to travel down the pipe in that direction. And then of course, it's going to reflect back off the other end and it's gonna come out this way. And if you've watched my video on standing waves, these two waves, in this case, longitudinal waves, will interfere. And that will mean we will get a standing wave. Now, what does a standing wave looks like? Well, to get appreciation of that, we need to know that when we get to this point over here, we're going to get a node. There is going to be a point here of very high pressure as the air molecules are all compressed at here at this particular point. Now, if we're gonna get maximum sound, in sense we're gonna get resonance, so to speak, in this pipe, we're going to get a maximum amount of vibration at this end, which is going to be our anti-node. So we've got no vibration over here. We have our compression over here, which is gonna be our node. And we have our anti-node where we have maximum vibration. Now at this end, the pressure is high. And at this end, the pressure is low. And of course, along the tube, we'll have varyings of pressure. So we're going to get a smaller amount of vibration here, smaller again, and smaller again. Now, in order to represent that, we need to look at the amplitude. And what we do is we sort of twist this little arrow around so that we actually, we get a maximum amplitude that looks like this. So we've got maximum amplitude here, we've got no amplitude here. And so what we then can draw is a representative of a standing wave. And it's going to look a lot like this. And I'm gonna do my best drawing it as best as I can. Like so. Now, what you can see here is a section of a standing wave. Now, remember, our sound is not a transverse wave. It's not gonna look like this, but allows us to represent the fact that we've got an antinode at this end where we're gonna get lots of sound, lots of vibration. And as a result, the air molecules are going to be pushed backwards and forwards here, and that's gonna generate a sound. Now, what is the relationship between the wavelength and of course the frequency of this sound in relation to the pipe length. Now, if you look at this example, if you were to follow this along, you can see hopefully that this here is only one quarter of a wavelength. So if I was going to just make a picture that represents this section over here, then all we have is that section right there. So in other words, if this is my length like so, then what we have is that I need four lots of those lengths to be equal to one wavelength of my sound. Now let's examine that a little closer and look at the different harmonics that we get. So here are my fundamental. So this is my fundamental right here. 
this is my first harmonic. And this is my second harmonic. Now, say some of you will say, hold on, this is not the right numbers, and I'll explain this in a moment. But I'm going to call this our first harmonic and second harmonic. But the values that we use in terms of our n values, which I'm going to discuss in a moment, are going to be a little bit different. So we've established our fundamental is here, and here our wavelength is equal to 4L. But we remember, if the velocity of the sound is equal to F lambda, then our frequency can be determined as simply equal to V over 4L. So there's our formula for the fundamental frequency of a closed pipe. But now let's look at our first harmonic. If we follow this along, you see that we have almost a full wavelength. Actually, we've only got three quarters of a wavelength. So our L is actually only three quarters of a wavelength. If I rearrange that, I get the wavelength is equal to 4L over 3. Then, if I substitute that into this equation here, I'm going to get F is equal to 3V over 4L. And then finally here, you'll see my length, if this is all the same, is going to be here. If you've got one full wavelength and a little bit more, I have 5 over 4, lots of wavelengths, which means my wavelength is only 4 fifths of L. Again, substituting in, we get F is equal to 5V over 4L. Now, do you see a pattern establishing here in terms of the frequencies of our fundamental with our harmonics? You'll see that there is a commonality. We have this V over 4L, but the numbers in front, our N value, so to speak, starts at 1, goes to 3, and goes to 5. So for a closed pipe, the general formula we have is F is equal to NV over 4L, where N is going to be odd numbers, 1, 3, 5, and so forth, for our closed pipe. It's a little bit different to our situation with strings, if you watch my video on that. But now let's examine what I did in my little demonstration. I actually kept the frequency the same, but I changed the length. And ultimately, it's no different, except, of course, that our frequency is constant. Here, our frequencies are increasing by a factor of 3 for the first harmonic and by back to a factor of 5 for the second harmonic relative to the fundamental. So here is our three pipes. But now I have exactly the same wavelength in all three situations and exactly the same frequency as a result but my lengths are different. So although we have different lengths, we actually all get standing waves with the same frequency, but in this case, we are altering the length of the pipe. So we have longer lengths, and as a result, we create different harmonics for the same frequency. And that's gonna help us when we do our calculations in a moment. But before I go on, I want to discuss briefly with you the concept of what we call the end effect. Now, you remember in the case that I discussed before, we're getting maximum vibration here at the point, And we use that in terms of discussing the frequency relative to the length. But the movement of air at this end is a little bit problematic we actually don't get an actual complete maximum resonance at the very edge here. In fact, it occurs a little bit beyond it here. And so instead of our wavelength being relative to exactly L, we get an end effect which makes our length slightly longer than we actually have. And the end effect often is added to the length so that we add a, a value of approximately 0.6 multiplied by the diameter. So in other words, this maximum vibration occurs approximately here, and the amount that it is in front of the tube is 
conditioned on the how wide the pipe is. So if the pipe is a very narrow pipe, then the end effect is small. If the pipe is really broad and really wide, then we're gonna get a larger end effect at the end. And that will skew your results if you just calculate your frequencies and so forth based on just the length of the pipe. You have to take the end effect into consideration. And the reality is, is it's just simply because air is certainly um, being disturbed as it leaves here. So as a result, we're going to get not you know, fully contained here. It's obviously fully low pressure over here because there's no walls to contain the sound and we're getting a little bit of interference or no, interference is actually not the right word, but we're getting certainly some disturbance here which is causing this end effect. And in a moment, as we'll discuss the calculations, you'll see how the end effect will take part. So now that you've got an understanding of our standing waves within closed pipes, let's make a couple of measurements. And we're going to use the measuring cylinder graduation to work out the length of the pipes in the two positions that we heard the resonance occur. And again, I'm going to use 600 hertz. So here's 600 hertz. And if I hold it there, you see it, it's sitting at the 200 level. And now it's sitting at the 900 level. So let's turn it off and see what we can do with that. Now what we're going to do is we're going to measure the length of the pipe from the water line to the top. But remember we had them at two different settings. Now the first one is going to be at 200. So that was sitting here, but what we want of course is the length from the top to the water level. So when I measure that, I'm going to get and this is an estimate, of course, about 12 centimeters. The next one was at 900. So if I hold it now at 900, my water level is now here. And so again, I'm going to have to measure that, not as precise as I'd like it to be, but good enough. We now have, I would say about 39.5 centimeters. So those two values are helpful because they are actually the length of the pipe for the two standing waves that we generated earlier. And we're going to use that now to calculate the velocity of sound. So what I have now here is the two pipes that we have when I created the sound with my app on my phone. And I only created two positions. Now, I'm going to make the assumption that the first sound I got with the shorter length was going to be my fundamental and my second one was going to be my first harmonic which is going to look at this but in the terms I'm going to do this calculation you'll see that it actually doesn't really matter which actual frequencies I have whether I have the fundamental or I have let's say a harmonic because the calculations work for any two successive situations and I'll explain that so we're going to look at this situation where I have in my calculations, as I did in my demonstration, I had here my length was equal to 12 centimeters. My other one was a distance of 39.5 centimeters. Now that means I can establish a formula which ties in this variable in relation to the frequency and the velocity. Now, our frequency was 600 hertz, and that is equal to NV over 4L, and of course that is NV over 4 times 0.12. Our other one, we've got 600, and in this case, we also have NV, but it's a different N value. It's going to be N2, and I'm going to make this one N1. And that's the velocity. I'm trying to work out the velocity over 4L, and that means I get N2 of V over 4 multiplied by 0.395. Because these are two successive standing waves, then we know that N2 minus N1 
is going to be equal to the value of 2. Remember, n is 1, 3, 5, 7. Can you see that I know I'm assuming this is to be my fundamental, but if this was our first harmonic and this was our second harmonic, this would still work. Now, the reason I'm doing this and combining this two, it also will remove the issue of the end effect because this has an end effect and this has an end effect. And because the end effect is determined by 0.6 multiplied, roughly 0.6 multiplied by the diameter, it's going to be the same value. So therefore, we remove that. So now if I put the two things together, if I rearrange this so that I have nv is the subject for both of these, then I'm going to say n2 minus n1 multiplied by v is going to be equal to, now the commonality will be 600 times 4. So I have 600 times 4. And then that's going to be multiplied by my 0.395 minus my 0.12. And if I calculate that out, I'm going to get a value of V is equal to 330 meters per second. Now that is a pretty good value for the velocity of sound. The velocity of sound is generally quoted as around 340 meters per second at roughly 20 degrees Celsius. So doing it this way, we remove the end effect. End effect. Now, if I were to calculate the value with this by itself. In other words, I worked out the velocity. I'm going to get a little lower than the actual value. But if I add the n effect, I'm going to get a value for v that is closer to the true value. Similarly speaking, if I do the simple calculation here, assuming this was 1, assuming this was 3, I'm going to get a value that is a little bit lower than the accepted value for velocity of sound. But again, if I then subsequently add in the end effect, I'm going to get a value. You can try that yourself in order to determine how this works. Well, I hope that's helped you understand the nature of standing waves in closed pipes. Please continue to subscribe and press that bell to continue to get updates of my latest videos. And put a comment down below if this video has been helpful for you. I'm Paul from High School Physics Explained. Bye for now.